Hey there, guys. You know, we talk a lot in the community about our replays. We really do. We talk a lot about replay results. We talk about what replays we're playing right now. We talk a lot about the news that came out at the time of our replay when a certain game took place. We talk about who won this game, who lost this game, what the standings are, how players are doing. But one thing we don't talk a lot about is what the best way to set up a replay is, right? If somebody's brand new to the hobby, they're trying to figure this out and uh, trying to understand how you can kind of jump in, like what are the sort of things you need to think about ahead of time? So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to actually set up your replay. Um, and uh, maybe we'll uh, touch on some things you might not have thought about. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about here is how to identify your goal. This is one of those things that I think uh, tends to elude us, right? I think many times the goal of playing the replay is to have a project to do that is not, you know, a project that we're doing in real life. But you're going to get more out of your replay if you can identify what you want to get out of it, right? If you can identify why it is you're doing this and what makes it interesting to you. If you're doing like a major replay, I'm talking like what I'm doing, playing every single game, it takes a long time and it takes a lot out of you. You need to have some sort of goal before your eyes to keep you motivated and to keep you going. You're not going to be able to just sort of like go from one game to the next and say, okay, well, whatever, I feel like playing this game today or that game today chances are you're not going to be able to keep it up. You'll end up dropping the project because you don't have a goal. You don't have something overall that's motivating you, right? So think about it very, very carefully. Like, why is it that you want to do this? Because it'll help later on. You also need to think, I believe, from the beginning about where, how, um, and how frequently you want to report on your project, right? I strongly recommend reporting on it because it'll make it a lot more meaningful for you it's also helpful to have a record of your replay uh, for when it's over. The reason why I say that is because there is some sort of like empty feeling you get at the very end of a replay, especially if you've put a whole bunch of time into it. I'm talking like a couple years, right? Once it's over, it's kind of like seeing a friend depart. It's nice to have a lot of records of what happened so you can remember it. You can look back on it. You can organize it and uh, you can figure out things about it. You want to make sure, though, that you figure out from the beginning how you want to report on it so you can start and you can do it in little chunks instead of trying to do it all at once, right? Um, I recommend reporting on your replay. You can go on to Delphi forums like so many people do. I don't know if I really recommend that because the forum structure is so bad and non-user friendly. I like the idea of blogging. As you know, I use Substack. I think Substack is actually ideal for replays. Though mine does need to be uh, updated a little bit and um, things need to be sort of brought into uh, uh, the right organization. But, uh, I mean, I find it very, very easy to use and I find that actually the reach is uh, pretty broad. You need to think about that, though, like ahead of time, right? And you need to figure out a way to make it something that's engaging so that people uh, will want to uh, communicate with you. That will pay dividends in the long run. Also, you got to think about how much time you will devote to your project. You um, can do what Conrad Horn did, as we saw, and come up with your own newsletters and mail them to random people. But, like, you don't have to do that, right? You don't have to spend all this time, like, you know, carefully sorting things out, figuring out how to print it out, you know, making up your own box scores using the whatever lithograph machine or something. I mean, you don't have to do all of that stuff, right? There are easier ways to try to figure this out. You want to figure out a way to make it meaningful for you, hopefully without spending like hours upon hours upon hours every single day doing the project because it will wipe you out. It doesn't matter how many of these you've done before. It doesn't matter how much you love whatever season it is. You need to figure out how much time you want to devote to it and plan accordingly. You also want to choose both the game and the scope, right? There's a whole lot of games out there and they... Um, appeal to different types of people and different types of playing, right? So there's tons and tons of baseball board games out there still. I mean, even today, they seem to be continuing to come out all the time. 
Uh, so there's a lot to look into, a lot of games to look up, and a lot of uh, things to compare one against the other. Most games, especially newer games, tend to have some sort of sample that you can download and use to try out ahead of time. I really recommend that. Though I will tell you that you won't get a full feel for how the game plays until you really put in like hundreds upon hundreds of games. That's when you start to identify the strengths and weaknesses of a game, right? Things like, I don't know, in Skeetersoft NP3, like uh, uh, guys being called out on double steals with two outs in the bottom of the ninth, and you're like, what just happened? Yeah, if you don't like that, you might want to stay away from that game because it will have an impact on you. Now, some scopes work better for certain games and some scopes don't work at all for certain games, right? What I mean by that is if you're interested in doing like a general manager project where you take a team and try to make them into the best team in the world as quickly as possible, you're going to probably want a game like OTP or Baseball Mogul, right? You could try to do that with like Stratomatic and with APA, with Replay. And you'll have a varying degree of success with those games, but my recommendation would be to find a game that is focused on GM work if GM is the goal. If GM type gaming is not your goal, there are other games that will provide a very enjoyable experience for you without all of that extra stuff. So you need to do a little bit of research and sort of look into that. And you'll recall, of course, this wonderful video that uh, we had just the other day about um, the different in the community between those GM focused games and games that are more replay focused. Like the truth is that it's all a replay project, right? There is no gatekeeping here. There is no saying that, oh, well, this one is better than that for this or that reason. That doesn't exist, right? Um, but uh, it's something to keep in mind when you choose a game. And remember that when you choose a game at the start of your project, you're kind of stuck with it, right? If you're going part of the way through like the OTP replay and you're like, this animation is garbage and is horrible. I mean, whatever, you could play without the animation on, but you're going to really have a hard time if you're trying to stop the replay like, I don't know, like two months in and then use a different game to finish it up. Like I've seen people do it, but that's a lot of work, right? I don't know if you really want to do that, right? Next comes the real fun part, which is identifying the season. So what do you want? Do you want a single season? Do you want to play multiple seasons one after another? Do you want to combine stuff and have a mix? When I was a kid, we had the old APA 1901 season and we had the newer 1991 season. I always wanted to take those cards and just mix them together and see what happened, right? Now, I know enough now to know that the results would be bizarre, but... That's an idea. That's something you could do. It's different, right? It might be fun, right? And then think maybe you want to do a project with the greatest teams of all time or the worst teams of all time or even like kind of a weird mix, right? You could have sort of a bunch of mediocre teams and kind of shove them all together. And the other question is what draws you to uh, certain seasons? And this is, of course, a very personal question, right? There's no like right or wrong answer to it. Um, I have a couple of uh, very quick ideas here if uh, you're kind of wondering what types of seasons are available and are possible, right? So 1938 National League, for example, has always been famous in baseball history. I don't know if it's so famous today because, you know, for some reason, like baseball history now before World War II is just forgotten, Right, this is the one where Gabby Harnett hit the famous homer in the gloaming to win it for the Cubs against the Pirates near the end of the season. It was actually in September, and the Cubs ended up winning the pennant by two games. You play through it again, you might have the Giants win, you might have the Pirates win. This is the sort of season that's very, very interesting to uh, replay over and over again with kind of a different type of baseball in a very different era of the game than what we have now. You could also look, of course, at something like the 1964 National League or even the 1964 American League, right? American League is almost a little bit more fun with uh, the Orioles and White Sox coming so close to dethroning uh, the Yankees. And remember, of course, that this is the end of that great Yankee dynasty. So another thing to sort of keep in mind as you think about what types of seasons you could play with. Um, and then finally, another one I always like to bring up, the 1982, both the American and National Leagues have really, really close pennant races with a lot of teams involved and who are close up to the uh, end of the season. Now, 
Another caveat to put out is that you need to be careful uh, with these uh, replays and with looking at seasons because uh, you're not always going to have a pennant race, right? You have to remember is that especially if you're playing with every single team, you're going to play with good teams and bad teams. You're going to play with great players and with forgettable players. And it's really the forgettable type players that will drive your replay. That's the most important part, right? Those are the guys you're going to spend time doing research on. Those are the guys who are going to capture your imagination. Those are the guys you're going to want to write blog posts about and go onto Twitter and tell everyone about how Harry Patty was the greatest shortstop in Dodger history. I know that's not true, but or second baseman, I should say, whatever position he played for half that season, right? I mean... Like those are the players you're really going to get to know as your project goes on. Not so much the Honus Wagners, you know, or the Ralph Kiners, but the guys who didn't quite make it, the guys like Matt Batts, right? But keep that in mind. You're not going to know all of this ahead of time for your replay, but you want to make sure that as much as you can that your season doesn't have a team that you just hate or that totally drives you nuts because that might make it so you can't finish the project. All right, next up comes leeway, right? And when I'm talking about leeway, I'm talking about historical leeway, right? Are you trying to totally change history with your project? Or are you trying to have everything adhere closely to history, right? So that's that sort of by the book versus, you know, uh, complete and utter like chaos. Everything changes and we make up our own trades. That has something to do sort of with um, the type of game that you play, but not necessarily, right? One of the more famous trades that never happened would be uh, Joe DiMaggio for Ted Williams, right? And people always talk about, well, geez, what would, you know, Williams have done in a Yankee Stadium with uh, the short right field porch? And what would DiMaggio have done in Fenway Park with the uh, Green Monster? Now, some games might actually get you kind of close to that and give you a better idea than other games as to how they would fare, right? Um, But that doesn't have much to do with the actual game that you're playing, right? That sort of decision has a lot to do with uh, the... uh, uh, with sort of what your philosophy is in playing the uh, season, right? And so that's the important thing to keep in mind when it comes to leeway. You want to make sure ahead of time that you know how much leeway you're going to give yourself uh, instead of trying to come up with this at the last moment, right? Especially like halfway through the season or beyond, right? If you're going to use real life historical transactions, you want to keep that going for your whole project instead of going part of the way and then, oh, we came across a transaction we didn't like, so we're going to pretend it never happened, right? I mean, you can do that. It doesn't invalidate anything, but you're going to enjoy it a lot more and it's going to be more fun if you know what the answer is to begin with. So the next step that we have here is research, right? Research is the part that I love probably more than even playing the games. Some people like it. Some people don't, right? Um, I'll show you, though, that like with research, when we um, look through uh, researching uh, different baseball seasons, sometimes we can come up with stuff and find stuff that is unusual and that we weren't really expecting. So my favorite example of this comes from one of the most famous teams of all time, which is the 1927 Yankees. Right. So we all know about the Yankees. We know about, you know, uh, uh, Mark Koenig, Tony Lazari, Ruth Gehrig, uh, you know, Bob Musial and so on and so forth. I bet that there is something. Well, if you've watched my channel before, you know this, but most of you probably are not aware of how the Yankees platoon their catchers. Right. We always think about it being like a right, left, right, left thing. No, no, no. Just go over here to Baseball Reference, which is the website that you need to be using for this research, and you'll see that Collins and Grabowski um, just were on and off one game after the other. It had nothing to do with the handedness of the opposing pitcher or of the pitcher for the Yankees. They literally kind of went 1-1-1-1 one, 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 one the whole way through, and then there was a little bit of change down here later on in the season, probably due to tiredness or injuries. But for the most part, it's just you're on today, I'm on tomorrow for the whole season, right? I mean, it's stuff like that that you discover when you start engaging in these types of uh, projects that uh, most people um, do not uh, know about, right? Including, I think, most baseball historians because they don't think of looking at this, right? It's not interesting to them. 
And then, of course, last but not least is play. This is the time when it comes time to play the games. Now, that doesn't mean the research ends once you're playing your game, right? Um, but it does mean, I really do believe this, that when it's time to play the game, it's time for all these other decisions to end, right? You want to do as much as you can ahead of time to set yourself up for success instead of playing part of the way through and saying, oh, geez, now I need to choose this. Now I need to choose that. Now I need to do this thing. Now I need to do that thing, right? You want to make sure that you're replaying play time once it's set up is spent playing the games and trying to make it as enjoyable as you can. I've said this before, if you really want to make sure that you don't get burned out like immediately, you need to look at old newspapers, you need to do research, read books about the season, look at what others have done with the project with the same season, talk with people, get to know people in the community. That's the sort of thing that will help you out the most, right? You don't want to uh, just sort of play yourself into a brick wall. Yeah, you also want to know how to pace yourself and not try to play like 20 games a day, which you might be able to do once or twice, but will drive you nuts very, very quickly, no matter how good your engine is. So there you have it. Those are my recommendations for starting a replay. I hope that more people start replays. What I would love to see are more people from the mainstream baseball community become interested in these games and sims and in replays and in coming and talking with us about this, right? We've talked about it over and over again. It's such a trope, right? The baseball sim guys, the replayers, they're all in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. It doesn't have to be this way, right? I mean, go over to Reddit. Go to the baseball forum. Look at what people talk about. There are people interested in history. They might be interested in what happened 20 years ago, but it's history, right? We need to figure out a way to get more people from younger generations to come over and have an interest in this and understand what replaying is all about. So there you go. That's how to set up your replay. Let me know what you think below, especially if you have any more steps or comments to add or anything you disagree with. Talk to you later. Bye.